welcome to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle, your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. I open case files on cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy, bringing you new cases, live broadcasts, and local lore. So get ready, creeps. It's Creepy Confidential. up creeps welcome back today we are dipping into the world of the paranormal full disclosure i have been officially investigating the paranormal since 2008 but i've been infatuated with spooks specters and ghosts since the day i saw the original ghostbusters back when i was a wee little creep our paranormal team was started by myself and a few colleagues of mine from the veterinary world i've mentioned that before We called ourselves Gigs, Girls Investigating Ghosts and the Supernatural. We traveled around the Pacific Northwest with one of our most notable locations being Starvation Heights in Olala, Washington, which is an episode you might recognize previously here on Creepy Confidential. Now, I'm not the touchy-feely type of investigator. I believe in science when it comes to trying to prove the existence of spirits and the paranormal. When investigating, it's not a black or white opinion, though, and sometimes there are things I just can't deny. For the next few episodes and streams, our topic of choice will be these spooks, specters, and ghosts. This episode, we are going to discuss a very interesting experiment published in the May 1907 issue of the Journal of the American Society of Psychical Research. The article within the journal is called, quote, Hypothesis concerning soul substance together with experimental evidence of the existence of such substance. By Duncan McDougall, MD. In the early days of paranormal research, I really felt the need to learn what sort of studies have been done to scientifically prove the existence of something within ourselves that could create a ghost or spirit. I really feel that if you're going to be a paranormal investigator, you need to know the building blocks and those who have come before you to try and do what you're doing. The Edwardian era, in my opinion, is really where things started to take off within the world of spiritualism. There were pieces of truth within things like table tipping, seances, and the crazy phenomenon of photographing ectoplasm, which we will get to in another episode. By knowing what people did back then during this sensationalism of spiritualism, one of the first things I came across was the 21 grams experiment. While the experiment itself is not exactly some huge study done over a long period of time with a huge sample size, it is a doctor trying to prove the existence of a soul. So if there is a soul, where does it go? Is this what we see when we encounter a ghost? So let's dive into talking about this experiment, shall we? The credibility of Dr. McDougall was high at the time, or at least prior to this experiment being published, but we'll talk about that. I find this study extremely interesting because a doctor who is supposed to have a belief in science wants to prove an existence of the soul. So let's break this one down. I like to start with the quote. It is unthinkable that personality and consciousness continuing personal identity should exist and have been and yet not occupy space. The good doctor is coming at this thinking that all energy has to take up space of some kind. He decided to conduct this experiment on dying patients that he knew death was imminent. His experiment started in 1901. He identified six patients in nursing homes that he would like to use as test subjects. Four were suffering from tuberculosis, also known as consumption, one from diabetes, and one that died of an unknown cause and expired so quickly that they didn't have time to get a chance to get the experiment properly hooked up and ready to measure any change within the weight. 
He knew he had to choose patients that weren't going to be thrashing around so that the scales would maintain a steady amount. And lucky for him, TB was super rampant. He learned of these patients while volunteering at the Cullis Consumptum's home in the nearby town of Roxbury. The building had previously been the home of a textile merchant, but when the building was turned over, conveniently, one of the platform scales used to measure the weight of the silk had been left behind. In this experiment, he would place a dying patient that's on a cot on the scale and record the weight. While reading through the journal, he did notate the loss of weight due to dehydration and evaporation that does occur naturally within the body, especially when approaching death. His experiments were carried out over five years with the help of a few other doctors. The home was rather concerned with the experiments and about the entire project. The concern was based on potential loss of donations, which were made to maintain the hospital if it proved that there was a flaw in the experiment. Another thing to consider is that there were scores of religious problems likely to come up when approaching the subject of the human soul. The other part of this experiment was extremely disturbing to me, as he chooses 15 dogs to take part of his experiment. Now, how did he find these 15 dogs that were ready to expire? He didn't. Within the description of his experiment, he describes the process of using chemical restraint and ultimately euthanasia on 15 healthy dogs. So needless to say, he lost all of my points for caring about him as soon as he brought this part of the experiment into light. But let's go back to the human patients. The subjects experimented on all gave consent to the experiment weeks before the day of their death. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that these experiments did not subject the patients to any additional suffering, at least on the human side. The first subject was dying of tuberculosis. He wanted these deaths to have little or no muscular movement so that he would be waiting for the moment of death. The patient took three hours and 40 minutes to pass. Lying on a bed arranged on a light framework built upon very delicately balanced platform beam scales. During the experiment, he lost weight slowly at the rate of one ounce per hour due to the evaporation of moisture and respiration and the evaporation of sweat At the end of three hours and 40 minutes, he expired. And suddenly, Dr. McDougall noticed that the beam had dropped and the audible sound of it hitting against the lower bar was heard. Not only did it hit the bar, it remained there with no rebound. The loss was noted to be three-fourths of an ounce, 21.2 grams. The sudden loss of weight could not be due to evaporation or respiratory moisture or sweat, as previously noted the rate of which that was lost. Also, no loss due to loss of bowel or bladder, as it was an instantaneous drop, not slow over time. It was noted within the experiment that while the patient did pass feces or urine, the bed would have caught it gross. After the initial drop, McDougal got on a bed himself, hopefully not the one that the patient was on, and his colleague put the beam back to the balance. He inhaled and exhaled forcibly as if possibly just trying to see if they could make the beam move. Now in my mind, I just imagined this prestigious MD on the bed just (laughs) trying to make this beam go up and down. But alas, the beam did not move. The second patient was a man who had consumption as well. He was on the bed for four hours and 15 minutes under observation. He also lost weight at a rate of three quarters of an ounce per hour, also due to this evaporation. He had a much slower respiration than the first case, which accounted for this difference in the loss of weight over time. 
What changed with this one is in the last 15 minutes, he had ceased to breathe, but his facial muscles still moved convulsively and then coinciding with the last movement of his facial muscles, the beam dropped. The weight loss was found to be half an ounce. McDougall and his colleague listened to the heart and found that it had stopped. But the tricky part here is you never really know when the man has fully expired. As the body's functions are hard to determine exact point of death. Therefore, not being able to coincide the exact moment of death within the exact moment that the scale dropped. Following his passing, they watched the bar for another 40 minutes without any further change in his weight. The third patient was also a tuberculosis patient, and at the end of their battle with tuberculosis, when they passed, the experiment shows the weight of a half an ounce that happened at the time of death, and then an additional loss of one ounce a few minutes later. The fourth case was a woman dying of a diabetic coma. Now, this one has an interesting note, saying that the scales were not finally adjusted and that there was a, quote, good deal of interference by people opposed to our work, end quote. Now, this one I was a little curious about. Does this mean that someone was physically trying to stop the experiment? I'm talking like a crazy commotion. Or was this someone trying to stop like the consent of what was happening. I just, you know, and how could she give consent if she was in a diabetic coma? That was the other part of it that didn't make any sense to me. If you have, do you think about how you feel, even if you're, if you're glucose, you're regular, non-diabetic people, if your glucose is low, you feel just whacked out. You can barely just walk one foot in front of the other, let alone having a diabetic coma incident. How are you able to give consent? So due to the interference, he regarded this test that it just had no value. The fifth case was another man dying of, you guessed it, tuberculosis. This patient showed a distinct drop in the beam of three-eighths of an ounce, which could not be accounted for. This apparently occurred exactly at the time of death, but when they adjusted the beam with the weights and then later removing them, the beam did not sink back to stay back to that amount. An additional thing noted within this experiment was that the sudden drop was so distinct that the beam, again, similar to the first one, hit the lower bar with such a great noise that it got everybody's attention. Dr. McDougall also notes that the scales were very sensitively balanced at this time, with plenty of time to ensure that this experiment was ready. The sixth and final human case was noted to not be a fair test. The patient died within five minutes after being placed on the bed, and while they were still adjusting the beams of the scale, it, he expired. Now let's circle back to the dogs. I've been an animal advocate even as a child, and I worked and still work in the animal field in one way or another. I had a really hard time reading this part of the experiment. So the scientist, Dr. McDougall, had a extremely small sample size of these six human being specimens. He decided to prove it in animals. He conducted these experiments on 15 dogs. He did this to obtain the accuracy according to the study and state that the results were uniformly negative. I can't talk about the dogs anymore. Mrs. Creep's going to start crying. That's right. Even creeps cry, my friend. At the end of this particular article within the journal, there's a little paragraph that I'd like to read. In the year 1854, Rudolf Wegner, the physiologist at the Gotten Congress of Physiologists, proposed a discussion of a special soul substance. The challenge was accepted, but no discussion followed. And among the 500 voices present, not one raised their hand in defense of a spiritualistic philosophy. Have we found Wagner's soul substance? So after reading that, I have a feeling that because this was prior to, in 1854, Dr. McDougall was either there or read this discussion somewhere and felt inspired. But what I kind of enjoyed was that you continue to the end, there's an editorial section. This reminds me as, you know, kind of similar to how we get in the comment section and we eventually, you know, kind of can talk crap. So this was their way of the doctors making notes about the journal. Now, in this section, it did seem 
like they were backpedaling a bit. Not the scientists, but the people who published this. As if the journal was published prior to him realizing it, it turns out it was. He didn't really give express permission to post this, especially in some sort of a medical journal, as he felt the experiment wasn't complete in nature. And one of the doctors writes, quote, It was not his intention that his experiment should obtain public notice at present, but in on an authenticated publication of his attempts, with the usual distortion that everything gets in the papers, has resulted in this prompt effort to correct the misrepresentation. End quote. So having read through all this, these experiments do make sense to a scientist. The science part of my brain says, hey, you had a theory, you wanted to test it out. Now, I may not be a professional scientist that has been put out in the public forum. However, I do try and approach things with somewhat of a scientific mind. Once a person expires and the soul leaves, that particular person, they should lose weight since the soul potentially takes up mass. So what's our opinion on this? First off, again, I can appreciate the scientific approach. However, the sample size was much too small. It's like doing a drug test for side effects and only testing six people and going, okay, this is what it'll do or don't do. You only have six people. Good for him for going against the grain, for testing a touchy subject like the soul, especially during a time with Catholicism being in very higher concentrations where things like that can be very touchy. The part about testing the 15 dogs, while it makes me extremely angry, it's similar to how we test animals nowadays. It does leave me with some questions. Do some souls weigh more than others? As there was a slight varying in the amount that that person lost. And what would make certain souls weigh more or less? For instance, if we put Jeffrey Dahmer into a similar situation, where at his passing, would his soul be next to zero? Or would we even see a difference? Another extra note is, I do feel this experiment could be expanded perhaps by using all of these death row people. <laughs> Sorry, folks. But that's uh, just a Mrs. Creep talking there. I guess understanding that opens a whole new can of worms. Considering the other day, for example, when Ted Kaczynski died, I saw people, pages, posting that he was a king and to rest in peace, which I was quite confused by, but I digress. Even with the extremely small sample size, I find the sudden drop in weight to be very interesting. I fully understand that over a longer period of time, while we die, we do lose weight due to these instances of you know, dehydration, evaporation, but what's the sudden drop all about? This could be significant. For those of you fellow paranormal investigators out there, hopefully this makes you perk up a little bit. When we get these images of either a mist or even orbs, and yes, I fully understand that not everybody believes orbs are anything other than dust, but is this a way that we are capturing a soul floating around somewhere? Is this a way to prove that energy, or better yet, the mass of a soul is What's kind of floating around? I think that these thoughts are the reason why this experiment was so interesting. If you ever get a chance, there's an author. Uh, her name is Mary Roach. She's written several books, but the two that I really enjoy is called Stiff, and the other one is called Spook. And both of her books actually reference this experiment, which is how I stumbled upon this thing to begin with. The first of these two books is stiff. The chapter's called How to Know If You're Dead on page 173. That she talks about the experiment. And then the other book is Spook, chapter 3, page 79, when it starts, the actual chapter starts, called How to Weigh a Soul. Man, can you imagine? That's exactly what she's talking about. So I really do suggest these readings to get you started, but also to look up the study itself. It's very, very interesting. Of course, it's written in kind of that Edwardian doctor talk, but it's very good. Well, creeps, we've made it to the end of this chat. That's all I have for you guys today. So a little bit of housekeeping. Mark your calendars for June 27th, where the gents of What Goes Bump in the Night podcast will be joining me here on Creepy Confidential After Dark to shoot the breeze and talk about why the world is so obsessed with the paranormal. I hope to get some good stories out of these blokes, as well as 
I see they've been out investigating themselves, so we can hopefully chat about that. So join us on Creepy Confidential After Dark. If you're watching this on YouTube, please click that subscribe button for further audio tracks and videos and join your fellow creeps. So join us next time here on Creepy Confidential.